Take a taxi ride in Jakarta these days and you begin a journey into the financial fiasco of Southeast Asia. Suharto. Suharto. Three to Yep. For fighting the traffic here in the capital, Jerry earns 30,000 rupiah, about $3 a day. That's a quarter of what he earned before Indonesia's currency crashed. Problem. The Indonesia problem is... Bank of Indonesia? Uh, debt. Debt? Yes. Problem. Big problems. Yeah. Yep. Jerry drives for a company called Steady Safe Taxis. Nine months ago, Steady Safe was turning over the equivalent of 9 million US a year. But Steady Safe's owners decided they weren't big enough. They wanted to turn themselves into a massive transport conglomerate spanning the entire Indonesian archipelago. To fund their Asian dream, Steady Safe borrowed 270 million US. As well, they had the gold seal of approval here in Indonesia. Tut Tut, the president's eldest daughter, a businesswoman with a finger in any number of big government endorsed ventures, was on their board. She was also the chairman of a road toll company in which Steady Safe held fortuitously a multi million dollar stake. In other words, what you had was outside money in dollars and Suharto family involvement. In other words, classic Indonesian crony capitalism. Today, Steady Safe, and what an unfortunately ironic company name that is under the circumstances, is bankrupt. And our friend Jerry doesn't know if he'll have a job next week. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Take care. Cheers. Meanwhile, away to the north in Hong Kong, there's one particular investment bank that wishes it had never heard the name Steady Safe. In Hong Kong, they say, not even the sky's the limit. In the past 10 to 15 years, mind-blowing fortunes have been made here, and very few lost. This Chinese New Year, the locals were putting on their happy lunar faces, but there's not a great deal to celebrate in Hong Kong at the moment. Only a few months ago here in Hong Kong, they were rubbishing their Asian neighbours' woes as financial amateurism. Now, even in the great financial citadel itself, the unthinkable is happening. Some of the region's most colourful players are being snuffed out in their prime. Chinese New Year or not, in another part of town, the man they call Dr. Doom is starting work. Don't let the big BMW, the ponytail or the lack of a pinstripe suit fool you. For 20 years, Swiss-born Dr. Mark Farber has been an investment broker in Hong Kong's land of golden opportunity. Well, I came to Hong Kong in 73. I uh, bought, you know, posters of the Chinese Revolution. He's an intriguing mix of eccentric genius and fish out of water. And then later I bought also other kind of communist memorabilia, you, you simply you'd... as an investment, because I thought that this is the art of the revolution. And one day, if people are so stupid and pay thousands of dollars for telephone cards, they will pay thousands <laughs> of dollars for this kind of stuff. But Faber knows his market stuff. In the past, the market has ignored his doomsday predictions. But these days, it's Dr. Doom who's mocking the mockers. In the 1990s, Asia came of age. As we move towards the year 2000, Asia will become the dominant region of the world, economically, politically, and culturally. We are on the threshold of the Asian Renaissance. Are they talking about the same Asia? Well, I think where others got it wrong is that people were living in a self-delusion and they were looking after themselves, trying to make everything look good. And there was never really an Asian miracle. There was a recession in 1990 in Europe and the US. It was bypassed in Asia. We had the Mexican crisis, it didn't touch Asia. And each time the Asians got more and more confidence and said nothing can go wrong. There is no more business cycle in Asia. 
we will dominate by the year 2000 the whole world and now you have a huge setback. Peregrine staff arriving at company headquarters on Monday morning were met by a media barrage. As recently as a few weeks back, Peregrine Holdings was the fearless face of the Asian investment community. How they came unstuck in their deal with steady safe taxis is a lesson that all of Asia is learning. Company sources say most employees are packing up their belongings before the liquidators move in. At the height of their trading frenzy, the boastfully Asian bank gambled with billions of dollars across 16 countries, dealing hard and fast in just about anything they could get their hands on. Equity, bonds, asset management, property, luxury cars, electronics, even shrimps in Burma. Peregrine's chairman, Philip Toes, was an uncompromising free marketeer who actually condemned democracy for getting in the way of his ambitious risk-taking. Steady Safe is, is, is one of our deals. Uh, but when he lent over a quarter of a billion dollars to Steady Safe taxis back in Jakarta, Post took one risk too many. Um, it was uh, an unfortunate transaction, uh, but it was not the, uh, it certainly was not the sole reason for us having uh, the problems that we did. Everybody that I talked to had meetings about Peregrine. Should we? Henny Sender, the Peregrine finance Peregrine editor for the Far Eastern Economic Peregrine Review, Peregrine saw the meltdown Peregrine coming. The Last year on this program, Henny told me the Asian economic boom was an accident waiting to happen. Every single firm had meetings saying, what do we do about Peregrine? They've got to be vulnerable. Do we want to have any exposure to them at all? And Peregrine went around saying, no problems for us. And people would say, well, what about Indonesia? And Peregrine would say, absolutely no problems in Indonesia. But Peregrine had a huge problem. Much to their horror, shareholders discovered the 270 million US loan to SteadySafe was a quarter of the bank's net worth. When the Indonesian rupiah collapsed, SteadySafe couldn't repay $1 million, let alone 270. And the very bullish Peregrine had neither hedged the loan nor gone to the market for the funds. On January the 16th, the bank went bust and the liquidators moved in. <laughs> Peregrine was a very ambitious, Hong Kong-grown financial institution, and it wanted to grow in a hurry. And they found, you know, they could go to Indonesian companies and say, we can raise money for you for the rest of the world for so much less than you're paying your bankers now. And there just seemed to be no constraints. So they could go to a taxi company that earns money in rupiah and not a hell of a lot of it and say, we can sell your debt in US dollars to investors all over the world. And it's so cheap for you. And it just seemed like magic. You have to look at the picture of the fellow who runs the taxi company. You have to be a super idiot to lend him any money. I would have thought so. Yes, I mean, look. I still feel somewhere, somehow, there's some common sense in business. And I mean, if you ask me to risk even 5% of my capital to this character, I wouldn't do it. You know, a quarter of your net worth to a character like this, I mean... But this is in an atmosphere of bullishness and optimism, people and this is a characteristic of every bubble, over-trading, go on margin, borrow and lend. Just two floors down from Dr. Doom, it was all over for Peregrine. With overheated Asian economies grinding to a standstill, Peregrine's collapse is now being seen as a metaphor for the miracle that's become a mess. I think better is a bit to the liquid data. To? Liquid data. To the liquid data? Yeah. Since the collapse of Peregrine, the silence from Hong Kong officials has been close to deafening. 
except for the government of Tung Chi Wa making it clear that they have no intention whatsoever of becoming Philip Tosa's white knight, finance jargon for a bailout. In other words, the swooping peregrine live by the sword and they can die by it. But Peregrine weren't the only cowboy capitalist in town. A week after Peregrine collapsed, another Hong Kong trading house, CA Pacific Investments, went down. When Peregrine crashed in January, no little people were damaged. Only big ones like Philip Toes who could afford it. Not so with CA Pacific. These angry victims protesting their way to the city stock exchange are not exactly dangerous left wingers out to smash the system. In this unashamedly market driven place, they're classic petty capos seeking accountability. Like Lisa Hung a freelance tourist guide already hit by the slump. And Lisa, like a lot of others, has lost her entire life savings. Not exactly a great start to the Chinese New Year. The problem with running an investment bank is this. You hire traders. They have no capital in the firm. They are desperados. In other words, they make a lot of money. They get the cut of the money they make, say 20% of their profits. So they take a huge risk. If they win, they can make 20, 30 million US. If they lose, they walk away and go somewhere else. At worst, they go for one year in jail and they write a book and make another million dollars. <laughs> you know, I think Hong Kong to me has become very schizophrenic. You know, on the surface, things seem to, you know, people are putting on a brave face. But underneath, you know, property transactions have dried up. You know, this place is so vulnerable to high interest rates and interest rates are going higher. And, you know, it's all very well for people to say, look around. Every skyscraper has lights on at night. This isn't a ghost town like Bangkok. But, you know, you can have oversupply in price as well as in supply. And I think, you know, slowly beneath the surface, all the foundations are beginning to crumble, whether it's property or ports. John. Hi. How are you, Josh? Nice to meet you. Welcome. Wow, this is something. In Hong Kong, money, in a couple of words, means real estate. And John A. Yung flogs the world's most expensive and sought-after realty here at Wealthy Heights on Hong Kong's Mount Victoria. So this is 44 F. Yes. If Peregrine made some insane investments, its more conservative brethren aren't exactly guilt-free. So this, this part of Hong Kong is called mid-levels, mid Mid-levels right? west. Right. Over the past decade here in Hong Kong, so this is banks have been doling out money hand over fist to property now. speculators. By Australian standards, I'd say this is maybe a $200,000 right. apartment with a $5 million view. <laughs> uh, there are two guest rooms in this uh, flat. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is one of the guest rooms. It's also not big either, is it? Well, it's, it's not more by Hong Kong standard. Yeah, that's true. We forget that. Yeah. Yeah. We come from a big country. <laughs> If you were an optimist, you might call this place fashionably minimalist. But to a cynic, it's just plain bare. So what's it worth now? Oh, uh, I mean, uh, personally, I would uh, say it should cost somewhere around um, 18 and a half million. 18 and a half million, so about, about four. About four oh. million Australian dollars. If that seems ridiculous, consider that six months ago, you would have paid an extra one million Australian dollars for this place. On a clear day up here, you can see all the way to your bank manager's office. And with apartment prices plummeting, that's exactly where a lot of Hong Kong property owners may soon be heading. At the peak of the market, we thought, well, it was going, uh, too, it was going too high, too fast. But we didn't expect it to collapse. We, we, we expected there, there was going to be some adjustment. But you didn't expect the impact of the rest of the Asian countries on you? Right. Don't they have jobs? Go away, come and visit them. You want to send them back to them? Can you push me to 
And so the panic spreads. This is the Wong Tai Sin Temple in the middle of residential high-rise Hong Kong. Over the Lunar New Year, hundreds of thousands flocked here to pray for protection against the economic downturn. You can hardly blame them. Last year they must have thought their oriental luck had run out. They also come here to have their fortunes told. Not surprisingly, in the current climate, they want to know whether to buy or sell their stock and property. According to the Chinese lunar cycle, this year, 1998, is the year of the tiger. The tiger is supposed to be dynamic and daring, hates interference, at best warm-hearted, at worst selfish. And this one enjoys taking risks, but has a tendency to rush into things without proper consideration. Sounds like a market analysis of Peregrine. Maybe Philip Toast should have consulted his Chinese astrologist or even these fortune tellers here instead of his market whiz kids. I tell you, I've been in Asia since 73. I have never seen a wealth destruction on such a massive scale happen. You tell me where it will end. I tell you it will end all in disaster. But will it end in disaster tomorrow, in three months, six months, nine months? That I don't know. But I tell you the whole system is at threat because of the leverage the world is living on. Back in Indonesia, the starting point of the Peregrine downfall, the Asian flu that struck down Steady Safe is virulent throughout the country. The IMF and the World Bank have moved in, committing billions in recovery money that many remain convinced is part of the problem, not part of the solution. And a politically desperate President Suharto is making all sorts of promises about the end of cronyism. Tut Tut, the president's daughter? Well, don't ask me how, but her toll company picked up a quiet 140 million out of Peregrine's ill-fated loan of 270. Some things change, others remain the same. As for Steady Safe, the company is now worth a grand total of half a million dollars. And as far as we know, Jerry's still earning his $3 a day. And oh yes, the Indonesian rupiah is still so low Steady Safe might not be making any money, but it's currently offering the cheapest taxi fares in Asia.